The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Hey kids, did you like First Blood and Deliverance, but did all those talky lines get in the way? Well, strap yourself into your Hurley jet ski and get ready for Snake Eater. What the fuck? Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilford Neville. We are here to talk about the Lorenzo Lamas action tour de force Snake Eater, the first of a trilogy. Can I just say, you brought her, you snake eater? <laughs> Do you want to try the, the plot synopsis there, for? Sure. So, <laughs> so, did we ever learn the protagonist's real name, or is he just Soldier? I, they might have mentioned it at the very beginning, but he's called uh, he's called Soldier. Everyone yeah. calls him Soldier, even people who have no reason to believe that he is a soldier, because he's kind of a long hair, bearded, hippie-looking guy. But yeah. uh, Soldier... Even his sister calls him Soldier, which I thought yeah, was a little was weird. a little weird. <laughs> Apparently, he was a member of a crack special forces marine team or something or other called the Snake Eaters. Search and destroy team. So he's supposed to be some sort of super soldier. At the beginning of the movie, he's working as a like vice cop, and he's trying to perform some sort of drug bust. And of course, nails the first woman that appears on screen, and then nails the feet of the <laughs> of the right. drug lords with a booby trap kind of thing, which leads to him ha being declared a loose cannon and turning his badge and gun, yada yada. Not even, like, <laughs> exaggerating. or It's like, turn in your badge and gun! You're off the force! <laughs> You're a goddamn menace to society! Yeah, literally saying the trope. It was amazing. And so then he goes to visit his family, I guess, and he's almost there, and he discovers that his mother and father have been killed by hillbillies on a rented houseboat, but his sister has not been found. Uh, it turns out that she's been kidnapped by said hillbillies, and so he goes to rescue her from them. What's really nice about the plot of this movie is that literally, like, at minute 30 and minute 60, there's, like, an audible click and the next act begins. <laughs> Th this movie is so paint-by-numbers. It's, it's kind of comforting in a way, I thought. Yeah, you didn't ever, like, have any question about where it was going to go. There you go, that's... That's a positive thing. <laughs> Let's go ahead and jump into our what the fuck moments. Uh, Wilford, why don't you start us out? My first one is right from the first scene when he's in the crack house. It's There's graffiti all over that uh, cra crack house that says things like, kill all violent people and get high before it gets you. Death by asphyxiation. I'll help by riding my Harley into the lake. Putting on a bear suit makes you invisible. The best way to get a knife from someone is to grab it by the blade and ram it into your chest. Sleeping bag death kick. And my last one was the closing credits theme song, which Michael didn't get treated to because he turned it off as soon as it went black. <laughs> but the, the song was called Soldier, and I don't remember who wrote it, but one of the lines in it, the one that really caught my attention was, Soldier, where's your sister? Can you hear her helpless cries? It was amazing. <laughs> Where's the ukulele when you need it? <laughs> Were you upset like I was that Soldier never eats a snake in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> there was a disturbing lack of snake eating. We have a fish shoved into his dad's mouth, and we have a snake menacing his sister, but he never gets near a snake. Was it a snake? I thought it was an eel. Oh, maybe it was an eel. But I thought it was a fish, but it could have been an eel, could have been a snake, could have been... Whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's not in Lorenzo Lamas' mouth. Yeah. That's for sure. So no snake eating in this movie. Very, very sad. Uh, no understanding of what police procedure is. <laughs> like at all. I, uh, My roommate wandered in for a while while I was watching this, and she's a lawyer, and she was like, well, that's not a Fifth Amendment offense. <laughs> and I was like, we have so many issues before we get to the Fifth Amendment problems, right. you know? Whatever that may be. We were talking about the end credits music. I did notice that the opening credits and, and a lot of the music through it, it felt like kind of a, a moody romance in a way. You know, it was like that kind of sensual, slow sax, but in, in minor key. It was like... Yeah, I didn't actually notice. What year was this movie made? 
I believe late 80s, maybe 1990. Okay, so that, that feels about right. The thing that I love about 80s action movies and 80s action TV shows, like uh, a year or so ago, I started rewatching The Equalizer, which then they made a movie with, with Denzel Washington. But, you know, originally it was like an old British dude. The thing when I watched that, I was like, oh, my God, like I had totally forgotten how especially New York crime was portrayed in the 80s because it's like. New York was just portrayed as this fucking cesspit. It was like, you step around one corner in New York and you might just be treated to a home invasion, rape sort of situation, no matter what. It's like Times Square, one block away, is just this festering cesspit of people who wield knives, giggle a lot, and call you strange nicknames. Lord of the Flies type situation, yeah. Oh, also, and bums are everywhere, and they're just kind of funny. In this one, we get one of the most wince-worthy bum moments ever, where uh, the cops are on stakeout, and so they're pissing into a cup, and he gives the cup to a passing homeless man who asks for a quarter for a cup of coffee, and it was like, wow, just the carelessness about the sanctity of human life and everything. It's like, ah, he's just a bum. Who it's cares? funny. Yeah, and then strangely, the same bum is somewhere else, indeterminate location, and happens to be happen up under their vehicle when they're on stakeout too, which leads me to believe that stealth is not exactly their forte when it comes to their jobs. The same bum stumbles upon their stakeout vehicle during two different <laughs> stakeouts months apart. Well, they are worthless cops. <laughs> I mean, the worst first of cops. all, I couldn't tell, was one of them a lieutenant and that's why he kept being called Lou? Or was his name just Lou? I don't know, but Larry Zonka is like the head cop. You can tell by the mustache. Yeah, and his like buddy who's like, hey Lou, hey Lou, I didn't pay attition to anything. Tell me what I need to know, because they're exposition <laughs> right. cops. Yeah, surveillance and exposition team. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's like, how does he not know that? And then then apparently they they don't they weren't there for soldier putting in the wire because they're so baffled by where'd you hide the wire? Because he gets naked. And they also didn't question the fact that he had been putting nails into boards for 37 hours before this bus. <laughs> right. Because, holy Jesus, the entire room is covered with nails when he reveals his trap to nail the bad guy. They didn't hear him in there with power tools and spring-loading <laughs> the bear trap. That chick who he has sex with, did you notice that she had an open-heart surgery scar? I did, and I thought it was going to be a thing, like they were going to say something right. about it, but nope. I will say I give the movie points for that, that they had a chick with an open-heart surgery scar, and it wasn't portrayed as weird or unusual. It was just like, hey, she's still hot. That's cool. Yeah, so that that was pretty good. I, I kind of got the feeling that she, like many of the actors in the movie, were probably friends of the director. It does seem quite like that's the case. <laughs> Soldier's parents were so wooden that I was just completely sure that they were the director's parents. Yeah, the mother especially when she's like, oh, I think I hear a noise out there. Which way do I look, Billy? <laughs> I love in that scene where, so they play strip, strip wire, I guess, to prove that Soldier's not wearing a wire and he has the chick strip with him. Uh, somehow he strips out of everything, but he keeps on the jean jacket until the very end, <laughs> which I thought was nice. I don't think he was wearing shoes at any point during that bust either. Uh, Lorenzo Lamas, interesting character. S sometimes I bring him up and people don't know who he is, and I'm like, he's been in a lot of stuff. I mean, he's a he's a pretty well known action star. Yet a lot of people just seem to have not heard of him. H had you heard of him before this? I recognized the name from seeing it on the cover of a bunch of shitty action VHSs. Yeah. In the yeah. clearance bin at Hollywood Video. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to view him as, as the best actor out there, but it's like he's, he should, you know, it's like Rob Schneider. Maybe I haven't actually seen any of his movies, but I know the name, right? Yeah. Lorenzo Lamas, he is a busy fucking man. Did you happen to look up his videography? I did not. He did nine years of Falcon Crest, six years of another soap. Oh, I thought, I thought nine years of Falcon Crest was a movie. I'm like, that sounds really. 
12 years of Falcon Crest. <laughs> no, nine, nine years of the TV show Falcon Crest. Uh, six years of a different soap. Five years of Renegade, his TV show, and made like two movies a year out of that entire time. He has like more filmography than like Woody Allen, for God's sake. Yeah, he has what, five movies coming out in 2015? <laughs> He might be in your room right now. Like, that's how much he gets around. He was in eight movies in 2014. <laughs> that man works. He works for his money, so don't... Nobody say a bad word about Lorenzo Lamas. He seems... And he seems like, a, I, I guess, a decent actor. I mean, I didn't think he was terrible in this. I thought he, you know, he, he carried the role well enough. I thought he went for ironic detachment so far at times that he just seemed like a robot. <laughs> Is he still playing action stars, do you think? I don't know. Well, he always had that kind of 50-50 thing. Like, he wasn't an action star in Falcon Crest or the other soap opera he was in. He was, you know, hot, Latino-ish guy. I mean, that's really, you know. I, I, I think one of the... One of my favorite lines happens in the bar. There's like this huge bar fight where nobody understands personal space. <laughs> and in the build up to the bar fight, one of the bikers turns to the other and it starts asking him about this dude who's going to start this shit pretty soon with Lorenzo Lamas. And one of his questions is, good brawler, huh? <laughs> Which I just thought was really authentic biker bar talk. It was also really convenient that all of the furniture in that bar was made of balsa wood. I mean, it was obviously replaced quite a bit, so they had to go for the cheap. Yeah. That was another thing that I thought was kind of cool was that the, like, kind of hot waitress in that bar was a much more, like, realistically proportioned woman mm -hmm. rather than a tiny woman. I, I, I give the movie credit, but I'm not sure if it really deserves the credit or if it was just kind of... We're just pulling from this small pool of the director's friends. So. Like, they would have hired a super hot model to play that part if they'd had the budget. Right, yeah, yeah. That bar fight scene has a really disturbing moment where our hero rips out the tooth of the guy who's fighting him, but it's okay because the guy he's fighting rips out other people's teeth. Right, but how did he know that? I mean, we knew it because we saw the dialogue going on at the other table, but... Well, I guess he saw the necklace with the teeth on it, and he saw the pliers in his belt, and he used his keen detecting skills <laughs> to put two and two together. I mean, I even if he had figured that out, though, is that really kosher? Like, I, I, I thought that was a step too far. And then I love, after he does that, he knocks this crazy guy out with two beer bottles... And a cop comes up to him and he's like, oh, what, is there a law against knocking a guy out with beer bottles? And <laughs> it's like, yes! Fucking yeah! <laughs> and even if there wasn't, you just ripped out a dude's tooth. Like, that's, <laughs> there's, there's definitely laws against that. Well, and all the guy that he knocked out with the beer bottles had done was, like, the least convincing display of martial arts prowess ever. <laughs> The fights in general in this movie were just horrible. The choreography was utterly ridiculous. <laughs> there were moments where you could tell he was like, oh shit, dude, I almost hit you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I guess, I don't know, added a, a separate layer to it, but not a good one. <laughs> and then the movie turns into True Detective. <laughs> <laughs> Which was odd. I mean, it's like, imagine if, and, and I didn't like True Detective, but imagine if True Detective were reimagined by like a seven-year-old, and I think you would come pretty close to Act 2 and 3 of this. There were a lot of scenes of hillbillies talking to each other, and it's like, it, it, it is maybe kind of in a way sort of like what a seven-year-old would think that evil hillbillies would do, because they kidnap his sister... Obviously, the implication is that they're going to rape her, right? But right. they have her for, it's not entirely clear exactly how long, but a bare minimum of two days. Yeah. And all they do is cackle at her. <laughs> right? Yeah. They're like they're like melodrama villains. They're like, <laughs> and twisting their mustaches because <laughs> they don't actually know what the next step of this process <laughs> is. They don't actually know how to move on from here. Junior, at one point, says that he's going to rape her and gets distracted by the fact that Soldier's there, 
But it's like, this was really a long time to wait, and I don't know if it's meant to be implied that she is being raped off screen or not. It's really unclear. Yeah. I got the impression that it had not happened yet, like that they were trying to build up tension toward it or something. Well, we get the the ubiquitous peeping Tom leering scene. Right. And it kept going farther and farther, like... Like, we see, like, pants removed and, you know, dirty underwear, like, starting to be pushed aside. And I was like, Jesus Christ, are we actually going to see fucking whipping it out and jerking it here? Like, that's really not what I signed up for when I watched Oh, I I signed up for all the dirty hillbilly junk. (laughs) Did you notice that in the background of all of the shots around the hillbilly cabin that there were actually, like, nice big houses... (laughs) In the back, I did not. On the other side of the trees. (laughs) You could tell a couple of the hillbillies were just really excited to be in a movie, and a couple of them were like, I am performing serious art now. Right, and more and more hillbillies just keep showing up. At one point, suddenly there's four more hillbillies. (laughs) Like, who the fuck are these guys? I think that one's Merlin Olsen. Yeah, I especially love when that older guy, I assume that's the Marlon Olsen guy, just shows up at the end and it's like, this is just some guy down the road who was like, you're hunting? All right, I'll join. You just needed another body for the body count, I guess. We did kind of skip over the whole stage of like his tooling up process, right? Of like going to the marina and talking to the guy who rented the boat and... Yeah, the old guy loves talking about his hog chopper. Another guy who I suspect... Knew the director. It was a little crazy. So that was when, at the point where Soldier first meets the hillbillies and he shows them a picture of his sister and they like throw it on the ground and laugh hysterically for a minute straight. I'm not sure why they're so easily amused, but they did find that hilarious. Their first move is to lick the picture <laughs> and call her a nice piece of ass, which is the only thing they can think to call her through the entire script. Right. They call her that repeatedly. Soldier, despite being some sort of super soldier, gets in a fight with a couple of drunk hillbillies on the pier and has to be rescued by, was the character's name Kane? Kane or King? Yeah, the the owner of the marina who rescues him by surprising them, driving out of his garage on his Harley straight into the lake. The one that he's just been, like, waxing nostalgic about. Yeah, he's just zoom! And basically everybody just looks to the left and then goes back to beating Soldier. It was ridiculous. (laughs) And then, of course, Soldier's unconscious for a day and Kane turns his motorcycle, Soldier's motorcycle, into a wave runner. Although I think the handlebars is the only part that he even used because it was clearly just an outboard motor on the back of that thing. (laughs) Who does that, right? He just... Soldier wakes up and they're like, hey, we turned your Harley into a jet ski. Cool. (laughs) You'll thank me later. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't understand why King Kane didn't just use the shotgun, which is what his daughter slash lover slash assistant slash whatever uses to get rid of the hillbillies. Like she just comes out with a shotgun and it's like. If you had guns, <laughs> why, why the why the fucking misdirection the with the motorcycle? Oh, this is also when we get treated to knowledge about soldiers' advanced knowledge of like improvised explosives, because he makes some sort of a dry ice bomb or something. To which Kane's daughter says, "I'll bet you're pretty fun in the bathtub." And he gives her that look that's like, "The fuck does that mean?" <laughs> I know we were all giving her that look. <laughs> Because he had said to her earlier, because she was, I don't know, just kind of bitchy, he said, like, I bet you're a lot of fun on dates, and I think she was trying to get back at him, and it didn't make any sense. Oh, I didn't Uh, didn't, didn't pick that up. (laughs) And then he's like, I'm going to go upstream and murder these hillbillies because they licked a photo of my sister, so (laughs) maybe they have her? And they're like, okay, that's cool. But the real thing to worry about, besides the hillbilly clan, is that there's a bear. Right. And so they're like, because there's a bear, take this assault rifle. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, aren't the hillbillies the bigger threat? And who needs it? Okay. He is in general, you know, talking about the IEDs and everything. I I mean, so like at the beginning, he makes that nail trap through uh, and, and the shotgun trap. Throughout the movie, he makes all sorts of improvised traps 
I think they were obviously going for that first blood Rambo feel where he kind of made the entire town a trap. That idea that like he could live in the wilderness and survive and everything and 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 take people out easily, right? Right. And instead it just It's a little more home alone than first blood. Yes. <laughs> if Macaulay Culkin had set lethal traps that's basically how this movie went that's home alone 4 i think we have just pitched home alone 4 like now he is a ptsd adult trapped in nightmares of these times and there's a home invasion and he has to murder them all and then it turns out that it was actually just his family coming home i would go see that movie he is in general more of a snake trapper than a snake eater i i believe he could trap a snake i don't necessarily believe he would eat one I was kind of sure, based on the name, that it was going to be a gay porn. There was a definite moment of, I nicked the census man at one point. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't know what that means, but yes. (laughs) And so, like, he also makes some punji sticks at one point. This movie is like nothing but implied rape and punji stick making. (laughs) Like, there's, there's really little else to it beyond that. But, you know, for somebody who is so good at making traps, he's not good at avoiding them. The, this movie also had a bear trap Right, in it. he just blundered into a bear trap. <laughs> You'd think that if he had all this specialized training in, like, guerrilla jungle tactics, that watching out for traps would have been part of that. And I don't think the bear trap he stepped in was even buried or concealed or anything. He just No, it was just in the middle it. of a dirt road. <laughs> There were a number of times where he did things that betrayed the fact that he had clearly never had any sort of combat or tactical training. Like, somebody's driving towards the shed that he's in on a tractor, and so he dives out of the shed to shoot the guy off of the tractor. Doesn't look left or right, doesn't make sure he has cover or anything, (laughs) just comes out and starts shooting at that guy, and of course gets shot himself consequentially. And the thing that I didn't understand about the bear trap was, okay, I get getting into a bear trap would fucking hurt, right? But then he's like, oh, my gun is like six inches beyond my reach. Rather than say crawl, I will just scrabble, kind of scrabble at at the ground and not be able to reach it. And he finally has to have his sister hand the gun over. And I'm like, you're already in the goddamn bear trap. Move, you know? That scene goes on for like 45 seconds. Cutting back and forth between him and the people shooting at him and his fingers almost touching the gun and then the people shooting at him. (laughs) That scene, which is, you know, obviously the climax and everything, also has a great moment, death by skull. We got got death by fish or eel and death by skull. Death by antler. The movie seemed to struggle with object permanence via V his sister for a little while there. Did you notice that? That during the gunfight for a little while, which was the world's most boring gunfight. It was literally three minutes of people shooting the broadside of a shed. (laughs) And then you see bullet holes appear in the shed, and you see bullet holes appear from inside the shed, and then you see reused footage of Junior, like, racking another round in his little lever-action rifle, (laughs) and it's just over and over and over again the same shots and more and more holes appearing in the shed. I'm guessing they probably did that not with squibs, but practically. They probably just shot up a shed for a while and filmed it. Yeah. But yeah, it was a very long scene of... A lot of people shooting at things and not a lot of people hitting anything. But he was hiding behind a wheelbarrow, which, for one, would not actually stop around from a lever action 3030, which is what Junior had. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. Okay. But his sister was also hiding behind it with him, but it was too close to the wall for both of them to be behind it. So it's like he's behind it and he's diving around and he's jumping up and he's popping up and laying behind it stuff. And then he gets up and runs out of the shed. And then we get another camera angle looking behind the wheelbarrow and she's back there somehow. Even if I could buy that she did some sort of magic trick and was back there, you could see the bullet holes near the wheelbarrow and tell like she would have had splinters in her eye right. and, and pieces of, of wood like jammed through her femoral artery at that point. One of the hillbillies is like, no way anybody could have survived that. I think it might have been Merlin Olsen, actually. Yeah. And then he comes diving out of the shed. And, and I, w- I kind of had to agree with the hillbillies. Like, there's no way he survived that. <laughs> the shed was too small. Merlin Olsen got the best death scene because, like, Lorenzo Lama shoots him, like, three times in the chest and he falls over. 
Then it cuts back to Lorenzo Lamas. Then it cuts back and Merlin Olsen is dragging a body away. <laughs> and so I guess he was like, oh, shit, my spleen. Well, I got to get Tom out of the way here. That's all the right. light. We'll leave the rifles lying here, though. I mean, I guess the idea was they made this movie for like $50, right? <laughs> And so even if they only made like $100,000 off of this movie, they made their money back over and over and over again. And most of that budget was ammo. Yeah, no kidding. That fucking shed destruction, that must have cost at least a few hundred dollars. I don't even remember the end. I think he's like making out with that chick while his like possibly raped sister just stands by uncomfortably, right? Well, and there's a helicopter coming in because she went and got the sheriff. Every woman in this movie was basically utterly useless even when kane's daughter is in the process of about to be raped by one of the hillbillies by slim of course even though he's tied bound gagged in a sleeping bag dangling from a tree soldier is the one who knocks the guy out though i guess to be fair she does save him with the shotgun earlier he probably would have died if she hadn't been there she fires around into the air yeah, and King Kane is useless. Maybe his real problem was actually that he doesn't know the difference between motorcycles and jet skis. <laughs> Maybe he just thought he was fixing them. Yeah, motorcycle. he's like, what the hell is wrong with your jet ski? He's got wheels on it. <laughs> Maybe his problem was alcoholism. <laughs> yeah, let's say that's a pretty safe bet. So um, what one thing would you change to make this a better movie? Yeah, that's a tough question. This is a difficult movie to fix. Probably what I would do is I would take off all of that crappy, like, smooth jazz 80s keyboard music mm -hmm. and replace it with theme song to Benny Hill. <laughs> just at all time. Just... Yeah, yakety sax, all the way through. All right, okay. I can run with that. Because <laughs> it's like, I, I guess I kind of... As much as I maybe didn't enjoy it, I feel like the movie did what it set out to do, right? Annoy me? <laughs> like, just be like, hillbillies are scary, and, <laughs> and uh, Lorenzo Lamas is hot and kind of cool, and uh, the end, you know? I mean, like, I, I think that's really, like, all at once. Oh, and, like, we got some tits in a shot. Woo! Let's throw, like, a time-traveling dinosaur in there. I think that's what it needed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, if if you want this to be, like, well, um, there's a topless woman. So is it a 13-year-old boy movie? There's a topless woman, but there's no actual sex. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, this is, like, a movie that a dad might let his 13-year-old kid watch while mom was out of town. Yeah. And, yeah, the time-traveling dinosaur would definitely have added to that 13-year-old boy cool factor. Like, instead of the bear just being Junior putting a, a bear claw on and swiping at people, which, it's like, well, why? You're already fucking creepy home invasion hillbillies. Why would you need the added stealth factor? I guess it, there was the stealth factor because it makes you invisible. <laughs> but it's like, instead of that, it's not actually a bear, it's a time-traveling dinosaur. And maybe Lorenzo Lamas carries a ninja sword. Yeah. 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 And the Harley at the end gets made into a Trans Am. <laughs> <laughs> and he flies away in it. Yeah. And he has a mullet and his mom doesn't care. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at a picture of Lorenzo Lamas with a mullet right now. Mm. Yeah, he is a handsome son of a bitch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right well i think that about covers it uh if you have any comments questions or additional thoughts on snake eater or possibly snake eater 2 the drug buster <laughs> or snake eater 3 his war then feel free to shoot us a line at info at ice on mars dot net you can always catch all sorts of updates and information on ice on mars dot net please rate and review for now this is michael t bradley and jay wilford neville have a good one Soldier boy, <laughs> your sister's screaming out for you. The soldier bellies have got her. They're holding her in a shed. Sometimes I dress like a bear, <laughs> tear up old people's faces. <laughs> Soldier boy! <laughs>
You have been listening to Ice on Mars. 